We are continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 23 today. And um, it's pretty interesting how we're in this section about the passion of, of Christ leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. We're right on top of, of course, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, uh, coming up here real soon. So God's timing is pretty amazing on that. But if you would stand with me, and we'll read these first 12 verses together. <clears throat> And then we'll pray. Luke 23, starting in verse 1, says this, And then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him and hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him, nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus for us and that he would endure this kind of mockery and shame and rejection because these are the very things that would lead him to the cross. Lord, I pray that not a one of us here today would so casually dismiss Jesus as being worthless, not worthy of attention, but we would recognize him as who he is, victorious Son of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's like the start of a really bad joke, except with ancient characters. Instead of starting out with a priest, a minister, and a rabbi, it's a Roman and Edomian and a bunch of rabbis, a bunch of priests. What is it that brings together a whole bunch of people with hardly anything in common except the time and the area in which they live? Well, each and every one of them rejected Jesus. They didn't believe his teaching, they didn't accept his true identity, and they either wanted him dead or didn't care if he lived or died. And so Jew and Gentile alike turned their backs on the Savior of the world. All of representative humanity rejected Jesus and sent him to the cross. And of course, this is what humans have always done. That's just our track record. We've been looking at the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights, and so we've seen from the Garden of Eden onward, mankind has always turned its back on God. We've wanted him to bend to our will rather than us submit to his. So whether it's Adam and Eve eating of the one tree of the garden that they were commanded not to eat, despite the multitude of trees that were available to them, or it's Cain taking out his frustrations on his younger brother Abel, or later on in Exodus when Pharaoh hardens his heart against the commands of God, refusing to release the Hebrews from slavery. All of these things are cases of mankind putting himself above God, rejecting God's authority. And of course, we know it's not just what we see in our biblical record, it's personal experience as well. We do the exact same thing. How many times have we chosen our way rather than God's way? Sometimes it's something that we consider to be relatively small. We indulge our pride uh, rather than choose uh, to worship God. We choose to worship our own entertainment. Other times it's something larger when we purposefully and distinctly say no to God. We choose to do things our way, thumbing our God. That's just the behavior of Christians. Before we came to faith, many of us chose to either ignore God or actively mock Him. I remember days of that. Perhaps you do as well. Perhaps there are some people in this room who are still doing that today. 
But whatever is our personal examples, we haven't strayed too far from the response of the Jewish priests, the Roman governor, or the Idumean pretender king. Now, contextually, it's been the start of a very long day for Jesus, probably the longest of his incarnated life. What had been the celebration of his final Passover supper the night before with his disciples and an overnight in the Garden of Gethsemane spent in prayer turned into the wee hours of the morning into betrayal by Judas Iscariot, arrest by the Jewish authorities and denial from one of his best friends in the world, Peter. Peter, of course, did not even knew the Lord Jesus. The Jewish Sanhedrin, which was composed of the chief priests and the scribes, uh, that's leadership from the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they wasted no time in putting Jesus on trial. They actually did it twice. Luke only records one of them, but they did it twice. The first trial was in the home of the high priest. It was illegally done, performed in front of a small cadre of those who had earlier conspired against Jesus. But the official trial we read last week took place at daybreak, and Jesus had been beaten by the uh, Jewish guards of the, the temple guard, and they'd been mocked by them already. But it was in that second trial that he fully admits that he's the Christ, the Son of God, and the priests and the scribes were able to convict him of blasphemy. Now, that was a charge that the Sanhedrin had desired all along. That's what they were looking to catch him in so they could send him to his death. But they have a problem. Although blasphemy was a capital offense according to Jewish law, it doesn't mean a hill of beans to the Romans. They needed the Romans to convict and execute Jesus, so that meant they needed to take Jesus to Pilate, so they got to try to trump up some other criminal charges against Jesus, something that would cause Rome to take notice and to kill him. Now, in the process, we find that Pilate needs to get the input of another imperial leader who just happened to be in town. That's Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great, the Idumean or the Edomite king who once ruled over all of Judea. We'll talk about him in a bit. Theologically speaking, what took place was a full rejection of Jesus. Earlier, last week, we read it was representatives of the Jewish nation. This time, it's the Gentiles. So be it Rome or elsewhere, all nations rejected Jesus as the king of the Jews, having no fear of him as the all-powerful son of God. So just as all peoples everywhere have rebelled against God, so too did all nations reject God's Messiah. The one sent to save the world was first despised by the world, disdained as being unworthy and unremarkable. How wrong they were. How wrong we were. Jesus is the king of the Jews, and not just the Jews only, but he's the king of the whole world. So we don't want to reject him. We want to recognize him for who he is and worship him as the Lord. So we have two different leaders here. First, we start with Pilate. We start with Pilate's indifference, we might say. Verse 1 through 5, verse 1 says this, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, be careful not to get the wrong idea from verse 1. When the new King James here speaks of the whole multitude, it's really just a reference to the full assembly or the congregation of people who are already gathered for this Jewish trial of Jesus. This is not a massive mob of people yet. Now, that'll come later on, but for now, this is just the assembled group of the Sanhedrin, right? The priests, the scribes, and whatever temple guards that were there beating Jesus all along. They had put Jesus through this kangaroo court the night before, trying to find some legal reason to put him to death. So that assembly then took him to Pilate. Now, although the Jews at the time rarely hesitated to engage in mob, quote, justice, they would stone people. We see an example of that in John 8, when they're ready to stone a woman for death for uh, the supposed crime of adultery at the time. They did not have the authority to engage in legalized execution, capital punishment, right? And that was the Sanhedrin's desire for Jesus. If they had personally killed Jesus, they ran the risk of the mob turning against them. And we've seen several times that the Jewish leadership were afraid of the people. They wanted to maintain and hold on to their power. But if they were able to get Jesus convicted and executed by the Roman government, then they could maintain the support of the people all along, right? So they led him to Pilate. Now, normally, the Roman prefect or the Roman governor would not have been in Jerusalem. He would have been in Caesarea. That was the Roman seat of government in Judea. But due to the size of the Passover feast, the amount of people that swelled into Jerusalem at the time, Pilate is there in the city hoping to help maintain control. 
then it makes things very convenient for the Jewish priests and the scribes because they're able to just take Jesus from one Jerusalem house to another Jerusalem house. Now keep in mind it's still on the very, very early morning. Jesus has a very busy day ahead of him. And so they go in the wee hours of the morning as the sun is still coming up and they wake up Pilate. <laughs> Can you imagine that being the first thing you hear in the morning? They wake up Pilate to accuse Jesus, charging him with all kinds of crimes. Now, you might note that the charges here against Jesus are somewhat different than the charges that were debated earlier among the Jews. Now, earlier that morning, they still asked if he was a Christ. We see that in verse 67 of chapter 22. If you are the Christ, tell us, they said. But the main issue at that point was not religious. It was, excuse me, the main issue at that point was religious, not political. At that point, they wanted to know if Jesus was the son of God. And if so, they could accuse him and convict him of blasphemy, which they did. But here, now it goes from the religious to the political. Here, when the priest accused Jesus of proclaiming himself Christ, they're saying that he's really proclaiming himself to be a king, the king of the Jews. And of course, we know theologically he's both. Now, what the priests split into different charges of what they believe mattered to Pilate, what they believe mattered to them, but both aspects of that are true. The word Christ, of course, is a Greek word meaning anointed, which is the translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah. The Messiah is the anointed one of God, who is both the Son of God, endued with all the power and the glory of God, being God of true God himself. The Messiah is also shown to be the King of Israel, the legitimate heir of David, the rightful heir to the throne in Jerusalem. There are times in the Old Testament that the Messiah is shown to be a human military victor in the role of a king. There are other times that the Messiah can be none other than God himself. We've talked about that aspect many times before, how Jesus has this dual nature, fully God, fully man. And now, no doubt, the ancient Jews had trouble understanding how this could all be reconciled. But in the person of Christ, the question is fully answered. He is the Christ, fully God, fully man. He's the suffering servant. He's the victorious king. Jesus is the fulfillment of every single messianic prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. He is the Christ. It's all wrapped up together as one. So as far as the charge of Jesus claiming to be Christ, well, we know that much is true. But everything else, the priests claim about him is false. And they engage in lies and false witness of him in order that they can bolster their case that Jesus pretended himself to be, you might say, the usurper of Rome. Right? What, what are they saying here? They're saying, oh, he's saying you can't pay taxes. Now, had Jesus ever said anything about paying taxes to Caesar? Yeah, but he said taxes ought to be paid, yeah. not forbidden. It was just a few days earlier that week when the Pharisees attempted to trap Jesus with a dilemma over taxes, and Jesus famously and very publicly told them, what? Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Chapter 20, verse 25. Just a couple days earlier that week. In no way did Jesus forbid tax payment to Caesar. How then could the priest make the charge apart from outright deception? Well, really, it's all insinuation. Because if Jesus is saying that he's the true king of Israel, then to whom ought taxes be paid? To him and not to Caesar. Now, again, that's nothing Jesus said, but that's how the priest chose to twist his messianic claims for their own purposes in front of Pilate. No small irony is it that the priest accused Jesus of perverting, or another way of translating that is misleading the nation, distorting the nation, when it was they who were guilty of perverting or distorting Jesus' teaching and reputation. They directly violated the ninth commandment, right? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, Exodus 20, verse 16. And remember that these are the priests and the scribes. They're the experts in Jewish law. And those who have the responsibility to teach God's truth could not, or at least would not, speak truth about God's Son. Just because somebody knows a lot about the Bible doesn't mean they know the author of the Bible. Just because somebody has a theological degree doesn't mean that they have a relationship with Jesus. And this is one reason it's so important for us to know the Bible for ourselves. Because we might see an expert interviewed on TV, so-called expert, 
interviewed by the History Channel on Jesus or on CNN or whatever, and they end up dragging Jesus' name through the mud. And we would never know unless we knew for ourselves what the Bible says about Jesus. So we need to be students of his word. And more than that, guys, we need to know our Jesus. Now, as important as it is for us to know the Bible, and you'll never hear me say otherwise, because we know Jesus through knowing the Bible, we can, it can be possible to study the Bible without coming to the knowledge of Jesus. And if we've done that, we've missed the whole point of knowing the Bible. Those priests knew their scriptures, those priests knew their traditions, but they knew nothing of the Savior to whom the scripture pointed and that's proven through their lies to Pilate. We don't want to make that same mistake. We want to know our Jesus and his truth. Verse 3, then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. Now, it may not sound like it, but this is pretty much a direct question and a direct answer. Jesus doesn't come right out and say, I am. But he gave a similar answer to Pilate as he gave to the Sanhedrin when they asked him if he was the son of God. Remember that in chapter 22, verse 70, just a couple verses up. They all said, are you then the son of God? He said to them, you rightly say that I am. Basically said the same thing there. See, this was Jesus' opportunity to refute the charges. Since he chose not to do so, it's as if he received Pilate's question as a true assumption. Think of it this way. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you said it, right? <laughs> it's as clear as it got for that culture. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Now, they might not know it today, but one day they will. Yeah. The Bible is clear that one day the Jews will have their spiritual blindness to Jesus healed, and all of Israel will be saved. Romans 11, verse 26. It says, one day they will look upon the one whom they pierced, Zechariah 12, 10, mourning of their sin against him it says that one day that the messiah jesus will reign over israel as the son of david and his kingdom will never ever end isaiah 9 verse 7 jesus is indeed israel's legitimate king and he will reign and again as we said earlier he's not just the king of the jews he's the king of the whole world see his kingdom begins in jerusalem but extends around the earth and yes one day all will see him all will acknowledge him as such and one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. If you haven't done it yet, what are you waiting for? You can acknowledge him today. Now, no doubt the interview with Pilate went longer. Other gospels indicate as much. Luke draws things to a close, and we pick up in verse 4. So Jesus said to the, excuse me, so Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. The verdict, he's innocent. Even with this direct admission by Jesus about being the king of the Jews, Pilate still finds no fault in this man. He found no grounds for legal action by the empire of Rome against the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, as much as we might rejoice in this recognition of Jesus' innocence from criminal charges, we've got to ask the question, why? Why did Pilate pronounce him innocent? Wasn't Jesus' admission of being Christ the king, wasn't that enough to bring about a charge of insurrection or treason? Now, Luke doesn't go into Pilate's motives for additional details. Neither do the other Gospels. Now, Matthew will tell us later on how Pilate's wife warned him not to have anything to do with Jesus, but apparently that warning didn't happen and didn't come until later in the day. Here at first light, nothing like that we have in our scriptures. Right? So at this point, we don't know exactly why. Perhaps Pilate is looking at Jesus, talking with Jesus, and he looks for evidence of Jesus' kingship beyond his claims, beyond the charges that were thrown up against him. Now, we know from the other Gospels that Pilate didn't understand the nature of Jesus' kingdom. We read that in John chapter 18. So maybe Pilate's looking for signs of armies or massive followers, some form of military might, and Jesus isn't manifesting any of this. But whatever Pilate's logic was, he did not see Jesus as a threat, and so he's willing to pronounce him faultless. Now, Pilate may not have seen it, but Jesus was more of a threat than what he knew. Jesus has more might in his pinky finger than what existed in the entire Roman army that was over the civilized world at the time. Pilate didn't have a clue who it was he so casually dismissed. 
do we? You know, it's really easy for us to write that off to the skeptics of the world, but there are many cultural, casual, quote, Christians who dismiss Jesus just as easily. And they show up at church a couple times a year, put a few bucks in the offering plate as it goes past, and they consider their duty done. Or, let's push it a little deeper. What about those who believe upon Jesus for eternal life, forgiveness of sins, but they never give a second thought to him being, you know, Lord? Is that any less a dismissal of Jesus than what Pilate did? Sure, we might not find any wrong in him, but with that kind of attitude, neither do we find anything right. They know enough about Jesus to suit the purposes but not enough to change their lives. If that's how you know Jesus, then you don't know him at all. You cannot dismiss him. He is the son of God. Now question, if Pilate found no fault in Jesus, can it really be considered Pilate's fault that Jesus was crucified? That's what our creeds say. Can we really give blame to Pilate? Well, yes, actually we can. You've got to think about that for a moment. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, proclaims it here, but yet he does nothing. Pilate could have defied the will of the priest. Surely it wouldn't have been the first time that he upset them, that he did something the Sanhedrin didn't approve. Pilate could have released Jesus in order to spite the priest, which I'm sure Pilate had done on many other occasions. Maybe trying to curry favor with another political party that he had more in common with, but he didn't. He did nothing. He chose to let an innocent man continue to suffer and eventually be tortured unto death on the cross. So this is an act of sinfully cruel indifference. And it's going to become even more evident to us later on in chapter 23. Understand, it's not enough just to recognize Jesus' righteousness. Pilate recognized Jesus' righteousness. He just didn't respond to it. We've got to respond. Verse 5. But they were the more fierce saying he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. They're more fierce, meaning they're strongly opposed to Pilate's finding. They claim that Jesus incited the people. He disturbed them. He stirred them up with his doctrine. They're basically accusing Jesus of fomenting Jewish rebellion, right? trying to stir up the people to revolt against Rome. They're painting the picture that he's a traitor. He's an insurrectionist. And again, more lies. They're just trying to pull out all the stops to get Jesus convicted, to get Pilate to act. Now, had Jesus stirred up the people? Well, yeah, he did, but not according to the priest's insinuations. There was nothing in Jesus' teaching that directed people to physical and military revolt. But we got to say, Jesus did leave an impact everywhere he went. Thousands of people came to see him at any given point in time. There were times that Jews tried to take him by force and make him king. In John chapter 6, verse 15, we read that. There are other times they were so incensed by Jesus, they tried to kill him by pushing him off a cliff. We read that earlier in Luke chapter 4, verse 29. So whether the reactions of the people were joyful or murderous, people couldn't help but have some sort of response to Jesus. And guess what? It didn't just stop with him. It continued into the apostles, didn't it? They had a similar reputation. They were the ones who, what, turned the world upside down, Acts 17, verse 6. They preached the gospel of the resurrected Jesus, the Son of God, demonstrated his power, demonstrated their changed lives, and people couldn't help but be stirred up everywhere the gospel was preached. Now, I've got to ask, if that was the reputation of Jesus and of his apostles, why isn't it the reputation of his church today? When was it that the church became seemingly impotent, unable or unwilling to provoke a reaction in others? Perhaps it was when the people of the church became more visible than the reason for the church. When Christians act as if they're unchanged by Jesus, then the world has no reason to look for Jesus. If we're going to provoke a response... We need to show them the Savior. Let us be the ones to show them. So that's Pilate. He's just one of the Gentile rulers who hears Jesus that day. Luke records another. Quickly changes scenes to this Edomian, this Edomite, part ethnically Jewish, but more Edomite, Herod Antipas. We read of Herod's insufferableness, we might say. 
in verse 6. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So Pilate finds himself in a little bit of a sticky situation. On one hand, he knows that Jesus is blameless of these charges of being an insurrectionist king looking to overthrow Rome. But on the other hand, these charges are serious enough that they need to be fully addressed unless he finds himself in trouble with Rome, right? So he probably wants to get a little bit of the pressure off of him, have some time to think things through. And this mention of Galilee uh, by the priests, that got him thinking. The regions of Galilee and Perea were ruled by Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. There's a, a map of how Jerusalem or Judea was uh, divided up at the time. Perea is over here on this side of the Jordan. You've got Galilee over here. Those were the areas ruled by Antipas. Um, Pilate ruled all of Judea, Idumea, and Samaria at the time. As Herod the King, Herod the Great's uh, empire was originally, or lands were originally broken up into four pieces. Anyway, that's a other history we can get into later on. At this opportunity, though, he sees an opportunity to pass a buck. Herod Antipas is in town for the feast, most likely. Herod Antipas normally resided in Galilee, but now he's in Jerusalem. Hey, let's get him over to Herod for a bit and get the priests off my doorstep. <laughs> It ought to be noted, by the way, that this account of Herod is unique to the Gospel of Luke, unmentioned in the other three Gospels, and because of this, it's been attacked by liberal scholars as being imagined. Yeah, you've got to ask, what would be the purpose? Luke has nothing to gain by this. It doesn't really change the outcome or the, uh, uh, the events really at all. Herod was actually long gone from uh, Galilee and Perea by the time Luke wrote his book, so... He has nothing to fear or nothing to gain from it being in there. He was actually exiled by Caligula, and uh, Herod Agrippa received his uh, lands and titles as a result. You might recall that it was Herod Agrippa who heard Paul's own testimony regarding the Jewish accusations against him. And he did that in the presence of another Roman prefect, Festus at the time. So an interesting parallel between uh, Paul and Jesus in that. The whole point, though, is that although this account might be unique to Luke, it's not unreasonable. Luke, as we've seen, has proved himself to be the consummate historian, to be very, very accurate. There's no reason to doubt him. And we can, when we consider that one of the members of Herod's household eventually came to faith and was a leader within the church of Antioch, and Antioch, we know, was the base of ministry for Paul and Barnabas, and who did Luke get a lot of his information from? Paul, his traveling companion. Uh, it's quite possible that Luke received the information from that man. That man's name, by the way, was Menaean. You read about him in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. He was raised in Herod's home. Anyway, get a fuller picture of these various rejections Jesus endured. Verse 8. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he'd hoped to see some miracle done by him. <laughs> Herod may have been exceedingly glad to see Jesus, but it was for all the wrong reasons. Why is that? He wanted a sign, not a savior. He looked for a miracle. He looked for a magic show. Herod Antipas had heard of Jesus for a long time. You might remember at one point he feared that he was John the Baptist risen from the dead in chapter 9. Perhaps he even remembered his father's failed attempt to kill uh, the ones claiming to be born the Messiah in Bethlehem. That would have happened in his youth, of course, in Matthew chapter 2. Maybe by this point Antipas had pieced it all together in his head. But whatever his thoughts of Jesus had been in the past, he now has a chance to see Jesus for himself. This is his opportunity to see if Jesus was worth all the fuss, right? If he's worthy of all the rumors. What is clear from this is that Herod had no interest in Jesus actually being the Christ. No interest in Jesus being the Son of God. Because if he had, he would have at least had feared the possibility of it being true. The only thing that intrigued Herod here was the possibility of miracles. He doesn't want the Lord. He wants a light show. Sadly, this is how many churches treat Jesus today. Now, we've talked a lot about the skeptics, but forget about the skeptics for a moment. And consider some people who truly believe that Jesus is God. How many people who show up at these proclaimed healing crusades are truly seeking Jesus as the Lord. 
Now, it's impossible for us to know what's in another person's heart. But it's no stretch to say that many who go to these places that advertise signs and wonders are going for the miracles, not the Lord Jesus. When people show up at a church service expecting and desiring to see gold dust in their Bibles, going there expecting to see people getting supposedly high on the Holy Spirit, no exaggeration, or expecting to receive a miracle by getting kicked in the chest by some self-proclaimed prophet, very little of that, if any of that, has anything to do at all with Jesus being the Lord God of the universe. All that stuff is entertainment. It's personal, ecstatic experience, not the resurrection of the recognition of the resurrected Jesus. It's not worship of God in spirit and truth. And in the end, it's barely any different at all from Herod Antipas. It's a desire to see a magic show, not a desire to see the Messiah. Now, can Christians ever expect to see miracles from Jesus? Absolutely. I can say without a shadow of hesitation that every time a sinner is saved, somebody's brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. The miraculous happens every single time somebody comes to faith in Christ the Savior and Lord. Every time somebody's made a new creation in Christ, Jesus, guys, does miracles every single day around the world. Amen. And yes, sometimes he does more visible things. Some of us in this room have personally experienced miracles of God. Mm-hmm. But those signs are not why we seek Jesus, and they never are. Even in the apostolic age, the miracles that are written of in the New Testament were done to point people to Christ, never to call attention to themselves. True miracles of God are a means to an end. They're not the end itself. Those who seek a miracle without seeking Jesus waste their opportunity. So we need to ask ourselves why it is we seek Christ. Because it ought to be for his glory, for who he is. Verse 9. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. So Herod questioned, Jesus refused an answer. Now Jesus hadn't provided much answers to Pilate, but he seems he gave him something, whereas with Herod, all we read is that he has silence. Why should he answer him? Jesus doesn't need to dignify Herod's request for miracles with a response. Herod may have been an approved leader within the Roman Empire, but Jesus doesn't answer to him. Guess what? God is still God. Herod was not God. Of course, neither are we. The only reason we approach God is because we're invited to do so through Jesus Christ, but we do it on his terms, not ours. We don't go to Jesus demanding things from him. We don't go pounding our fingers into certain Bible verses, supposedly claiming those verses for ourselves, insisting in prayer that God better deliver on this, otherwise I'm walking away. Guys, that's not faith, that's rebellion. That's us putting ourselves above God. That's what Herod was doing. That's pretending we're the Lord and he's the servant. It's sinfully backward. Yes, as born-again believers in Jesus, we're invited to freely go to God in prayer and boldly do so. We're invited to pray in faith, believing his promises to be true, always, though, in reverence and humility. Because Jesus is Lord, not us. He's God. We are the servants. But that Jesus refused to answer Herod demonstrates a key truth that surely irked Herod to his core. And that's the fact that Jesus was in the one that was in control, not Herod. No matter what Herod's ranting may have been, his whining may have been, or whatever it was he did at the time, he could not threaten or manipulate Jesus into a response. He could not force his own way. Even when Jesus was a prisoner in Herod's house, Jesus was in full control of the situation because God always is. Not that people weren't provoking Jesus to response. They were. Look at verse 10. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. You might notice here that Jesus hadn't gone to Herod alone. At least a few, if not all of the chief priests and scribes who had gone with Jesus to Pilate originally went with him over to Herod. And just as they did with the Roman, they did with the Idumean. They're always accusing Jesus. They're always bringing more criminal charges against him. You know, it's almost as if they don't trust the evidence to speak for itself, (laughs) which it didn't. (laughs) No doubt the Jews are trying to force the outcome. They're trying to manipulate things. You know, too often we found it's the loudest voice that wins the argument. That's the tactic of the priest. They're going to keep shouting until they get their way. At this point, though, Herod's all too willing to go along with it. 
Like Pilate, Herod Antipas had no reason to appease the Jewish priests, though there was a faction among the Jewish leadership that did support him. We've read about the Herodians in the past. But even so, Jesus' refusal to answer him gets under his skin, and he turns Jesus over to his guards for mockery. For Jesus to be treated with contempt, what the word means there is for him to be treated as worthless. Someone to be treated as someone who deserved maltreatment. For him to be mocked was for him to be subject to derision. The word is actually used at some points to trick people into making a fool of themselves. Of course, Jesus can't be tricked with anything. But basically, the treatment he got from Herod's guards was very similar to the treatment he got from the Sanhedrin officials. And the wording is very similar here. They're treating this as their cruel playtime, right? They wanted to toy with a man claiming to be king, and that's why they put this robe around him, this gorgeous robe, or splendid, brilliant, really, is the idea, something that might be found on a king. So if that's Jesus' claim, they're going to dress him the part, mock him. It's been 2,000 years, but people still mock the Messiah. In fact, in our postmodern Western culture, it seems like Jesus is mocked more than ever. Atheists routinely ridicule those who believe in, quote, imaginary tales of the Bible, ignorant myths about God. Some people even go so far, although it's rare to hear this, you see some people claim that Jesus himself was morally evil. How so? Because, you know, he healed some people of blindness, but not everybody. Pick and chose what miracles he performed, so that makes him evil. But whatever the argument they take this gracious revelation of God given us in Jesus Christ and they spit in his face. Guys, how ought we as Christians respond to such things? Well, how did Jesus respond? He died for them. That's amazing to me. Jesus died upon the cross and when he did, he died just as much for Herod and his thugs as he did for everybody else. Jesus died for the sins of the truly despicable people like you and me. When Jesus was hated, he did not hate. When he was insulted, he did not insult. Instead, he gave himself as a sacrifice, and in the process, he serves as our example. Peter writes of this, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth, quoting, of course, from Isaiah 53, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. How do we respond when mocked by the world for following Jesus? Guys, we keep following Jesus. We walk in his example, forgiving those who sin against us, and we commit ourselves to our Heavenly Father, trusting in his ultimate plan. We walk by faith, not by sight, knowing that God will be glorified as we testify of Jesus through our attitudes and through our actions. Why did, by the way, Herod send, Pilate, uh, send Jesus back to Pilate? Jesus was Galilean, right? So didn't Herod have jurisdiction? Well, he had jurisdiction over Galilee, but they're still in Jerusalem at the time, right? Herod has a lot of freedom for how he is able to treat Jesus as a prisoner, but he does not have authority within Jerusalem to execute him. So even if Herod thought Jesus to be innocent, he doesn't free Jesus any more than Pilate did. Obviously, Herod didn't think Jesus was a threat. That's why he mocked him. But he also doesn't want to act on Jesus' behalf. He sends Jesus back to Pilate to die, leaving the choice in Pilate's hands on how to proceed. Verse 12 that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with one another. You know, they say politics make strange bedfellows. We see it here. Pilate and Herod had previously been rivals. Uh, Pilate was the one who replaced Antipas' brother um, Archelaus as the ruler of Judea. And no doubt Antipas had wanted to inherit the lands that Archelaus once ruled, but Rome took that over and ruled it directly at that point. In any case, they didn't like each other at first. At this point now, they've got at least one thing in common, 
and they each rejected the king of the Jews. They had a common disdain of Jesus. Same thing, of course, happens all over the world today. People who are otherwise enemies of each other still hate the people of God. They still find common cause to oppose Christ. So you've got this terrible day proceeding for Jesus. But the other thing that continues here is the world's rejection of him. First, it had been the Jews. But it's not the Jews alone. They cannot be blamed. It's also the Gentiles. All the world rejected Jesus. He was delivered over to two different Gentile rulers the same day, gets the same result. At first glance, these two men appear to be very, very different. Pilate is you know, indifferent. He doesn't care whether or not Jesus lives or dies, doesn't care whether or not justice was done. Herod is insufferable. He wants Jesus for entertainment value, extracts entertainment through mockery and beatings once he doesn't get his miracle. But both rulers were in sin. They asserted themselves over the Son of God and they rejected Him as God. As bad as it was, they didn't recognize Jesus for who He was. It's far worse for them to turn Jesus over to death and they turn their back on Him altogether. Now, i got to admit, as Christians, it might be weird to read accounts like this and wonder, okay, what's the application for us? What is it that we learn from these men? After all, they were plainly unbelievers. So what does a believer need to do from this? Well, first of all, we've got to remember we weren't the only people in the world that Luke 23 was written for. (laughs) Not everybody who reads Luke 23 is a believer, right? Many people are in the same place as either Pilate or Herod, having dismissed Jesus as being insignificant or irrelevant, and how wrong that is. I guarantee you the moment that they died and then opened up their eyes to see the king, they realized that Jesus was not insignificant at all. Can you imagine the pit in their stomach when they finally realized whom it was they mocked and had killed? And I tell you the truth, sadly, multitudes of skeptics, atheists, and even cultural Christians who are Christians in name only, but not in faith, they will experience the same thing. You don't want to be one of them. You want to see Jesus for who he is, and you need to respond in faith. Second, as we come to Christ, we need to do so on his terms. Ask yourself, why is it that I seek Jesus? Do I really want the truth, or are we just looking for an excuse not to believe, like Pilate? Or like Herod, we want the miracles, we want the signs, we want the benefits, we want the things that make us feel good, but we don't really have a desire for a Savior and a Lord. Why is it that we come to Christ? We need to examine ourselves. And then third, if you have come to Christ in sincere faith, humbly submitted to him, now we need to walk in his footsteps. We need to walk as those who have been changed and transformed by him in order that we can stir up the people around us to respond to him. When we walk as those forgiven by Christ, when we extend that same forgiveness to others, They will see Jesus and come to know him for themselves. That is our privilege. That's our goal. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. Thank you that he endured this in order that he would go to the cross and fulfill the plan that you had for him. Lord, may we never forget that both Jew and Gentile alike despised and rejected him and sent him away. All of humanity bears the guilt for the cross. But Lord, let us never take the rejection of Jesus for granted. He is not one to dismiss. He is not in the slightest bit insignificant. Jesus is the most significant person in all of the universe. Help us see him rightly for who he is. And first, Lord, I would pray for those among us who have never submitted themselves to Jesus, they've never truly come to faith. Perhaps they participated in some trappings of church, but they've never truly seen Jesus as the Lord, the one who died for them the one who paid the price for their sins, the one who now lives forever in victory as a risen Son of God. 
Help them now at this time in their heart and their own way. Embrace Jesus by faith. Turning away from their things of the past and those sins, leaving those behind. To follow after Jesus, asking Jesus, forgive me, be my Lord, be my Savior. Transform me. Make me a child of God. Lord, you give them the words they need to cry out to you. And then when they do, Lord, give them the assurance that you are working within them, giving them new life. Thank you for your promise in your word that those who come to Jesus in faith will not be turned away. And Father, for the rest of us, help us, one, examine our motives, why it is we come to you, why it is we serve, but two, help us follow you in steadfast faith allowing Jesus to shine brightly from us that the world would continue to be turned upside down. And we ask this all in Jesus' name.